The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Half an hour from now, when this Equitable Society program ends, phones will be ringing all over America. People will be phoning their Equitable Society representatives and saying, Will you bring me a copy of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers? I've just heard about this service on This Is Your SCI. Hundreds of other listeners will send truth cards to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. How do we know? It happens every year when we make this offer. What is this fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers? What facts does it help you find? Listen carefully in about 14 minutes, and you'll learn all about this famous chart created for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Voyage of Terror. The overwhelming majority of those of you who listen to these case histories from the files of your FBI do so because you feel that this affords you a half hour of escape. To most of you, the world of crime is a never-never land. The fact that the past year saw the commission of a million and a half major crimes is of only passing interest. Because in your own mind, crimes are something which happen to other people and which therefore really don't affect you. If that is an accurate reflection of your feelings, then your FBI would like to warn you before it is too late that you are laboring under a delusion. Crime is like hunger. If there is a widespread starvation anywhere in the world, it must ultimately affect you. For it will continue to spread until something is done to stop it. In similar fashion, the crime wave will continue to grow in direct proportion to the public apathy. Indeed, it has grown until now. There is no sanctuary from crime. Wherever you may be, in whatever remote corner of the country this broadcast finds you, it is perfectly possible. In fact, it is almost probable that crime is just around the corner. Tonight's file opens aboard the El Dorado, a small boat used by Dr. Henry Wilson and his wife in their search for rare specimens of sea life. It is late afternoon, and a heavy fog plays over the Pacific off the southern California coast. Dr. Wilson is at the wheel as his wife approaches. Hey, anything? Oh, not very much. But according to the last reading I took, we're headed straight into the harbor. I don't ever remember a fog closing in this quickly. How are things below? Fine. I think they'll be quite pleased at the museum when they see what they brought back. I know they will. Henry, I think I see something off the port side. Hmm? Well, I can't make anything out. Well, I was sure. Wait, I just caught a glimpse of it again. Yes. I see something now myself. It's like a small boat. That's what it is. We gotta help them. All right. Ahoy there. Ahoy there. They're close enough to hear you blow the frog horn. I can see the name on her now, Henry. She's the Neptune's pal. She's drifting this way. Marjorie, get the boat hook. All right, dear. Anybody aboard? Here you are, Henry. Oh, thanks. I think she's close enough now for me to reach her. Let me help. Got her. Now, let's pull her in. There. Henry, there's a man lying on the deck. Yes. He's bleeding. Marjorie, take the hook. Hold it fast. I'm going to jump over. All right. Who better give me 
a hand, Marjorie. He's bleeding, but he's still alive. A little later, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Murray Bruxton. Oh, Murray. Hi, Jim. I just going to leave a note on your desk. Why? Oh, I called a couple of minutes ago. There was no answer in your extension. Oh, well, I just got back in the room. Huh? What are you doing over there? Oh, the members of the local boys' club wanted somebody from the office to give them a lecture on firearms. Thanks. I just finished the Gleason case this morning, so the SAC sent me over. Huh? Do any firing? Yes, yes. A pistol. How'd you do? Mm, 299 Out of 300 Yeah. Well, you're slipping. <laughs> <laughs> Why were you looking for me, Jim? Oh, the SAC just assigned us to work on a case together. What kind? Armed robbery and murder. Well, a savings bank insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was held up. The manager was killed. Any leads? Yes, we know who did it. It was a petty larceny hoodlum named George Morgan. Morgan held up the Oak City State Bank in Oak City about a quarter of five this afternoon. I see. The Oak City police captured Morgan almost immediately after the robbery, but he escaped before he could be booked. Oh, fine. He uh, headed toward the ocean front. One of the police fired a couple of shots at him. Morgan was hit, but he wasn't hurt badly. How do we know that? Well, he left a trail of blood behind him. He uh, still had enough strength when he got to the shore to assault a man named Carlisle and steal his boat. I see. It's a small craft, and since Morgan's record shows that he received a dishonorable discharge from the Navy, he can probably handle the boat alone. Jim, what's in Morgan's record? Well, he committed his first crime when he was 11. He was allowed to go free because of his youth. He was discharged from the Navy for being a pathological liar. I see. After his last arrest, three years ago, which was for armed robbery, he was convicted, given a 10-year sentence. Uh, he's out on parole now. Out on parole? That's right. Morgan happened to hit one of those parole boards that seems to delight in pardoning dangerous criminals. I'll never be able to understand that. Well, nobody can, Murray. Uh, Jim, what was the name of the boat that Morgan stole from Mr. Carlisle? Neptune's pal. Oh, he's going to have to abandon it pretty soon. Why? Well, Mr. Carlisle told the police it didn't have very much gasoline in the tank. Oh, I see. Uh, Murray, look, it's only about 15 miles up to Oak City. Why don't you run up there and see if you can find out on him, huh? All right, Jim. I'll go over to the Coast Guard and see if they can give us any help. <laughs> Just right, Phil. You'll be all right. Thank you. Is your name Carlyle? Well, yes. How'd you know? Before you came to, I looked at the registration papers in the cabin. Oh. I must have been out for quite a while. The last thing I remember was that it was still light. That's quite a nasty wound you have. Yeah. How'd it happen? I, uh... I was fishing with a harpoon. As I was about to throw it, it slipped and hit my head. You're lucky that my wife once had some nursing experience. You were bleeding quite badly. Oh, thank you very much, ma'am. That's all right. How do you feel now? Okay, thank you. We've tried to start your motor before, but there doesn't seem to be any gas in the tank. I'd suggest you let us throw you in. Then if I were you, I'd go to a hospital and get a tetanus shot. We've got our phone in our boat. We can call the Coast Guard now and let them know your face. Well, I'd, uh, I'd rather you didn't... But they might be searching for you. Well, look, you know, if you called, it would cost me a lot of money. How? Well, my uh, my dad's president of a steel company. He sent me here to California on a very important business mission. He told me it was my last chance. If I didn't accomplish it, he'd not only refuse to give me another job, but he'd cut me out of his will. Oh. Uh... So if you call the Coast Guard, there'll be a lot of publicity in the papers about me, and Dad will surely see it. We won't call. Oh, thanks, Rosie. Say, how about my going back aboard our boat and preparing some food? I need your help, Henry. All right. We'll keep the lines between our boats, Mr. Carlisle. You can eat with us when the food's ready. Right. Here, Marjorie. Let me give you a hand. All right. There you are. Careful, dear. The deck's a little slippery. I'll watch it. You go below, dear. I want to check the line. Then I'll be right down to help you. Henry. Yes? I want you to call the Coast Guard. But Mr. Carlisle... I'm fairly certain he's not Mr. Carlisle. Why? When I was putting the dressing on his hand, I noticed he has the initial GM tattooed on his arm. 
And he lied to us about his wound. How do you know? I worked in a hospital long enough to recognize a bullet wound when I see one. Oh. Please call the Coast Guard right now. Jim, I don't envy anybody out on that ocean tonight. Now, I've never seen the fog this thick. It's really rough. How did you make out with the Coast Guard? I just left them. Oh? Have they located the missing boat? It was accidentally located for them. What do you mean? Well, the Metropolitan Museum owns a yacht named the El Dorado. Uh-huh. A man aboard her named Dr. Wilson called the Coast Guard a little while ago. The fog was too heavy for him to give his exact position, but he said that he and his wife had picked up a boat named Neptune's Pal with an injured man aboard her. That must be Morgan. Mm-hmm. Did the Coast Guard tell this Dr. Wilson about Morgan? No, they wanted to check with us first to find out whether or not to let him know. They thought he might be frightened by the knowledge. I think he ought to know, Jim. I just talked with the SAC. He agrees with you. Who did you talk to at the Coast Guard? A uh, Lieutenant Gilbert. He said he asked the doctor to call him back in a little while. He ought to call the doctor. They might have some difficulty in contacting him, Murray. Well, I thought you said they had a telephone on the boat. Well, the thing about those small ship-to-shore telephones is unless you have the phone on and hear your call letters, there's no way of knowing that someone is trying to get through to you. Oh, I see. But he should be trying. Murray, I think we ought to go down to Coast Guard headquarters in the harbor and work right along with Lieutenant Gilbert. <laughs> Marjorie? Yes? I called the Coast Guard. Good. I spoke to a Lieutenant Gilbert. He asked me to call him back in a little while. He said he might have some message for me. Timmy, dear, I think it might be better if you called him now instead of waiting. But why? I just don't like having that man this close to us. Now, Marjorie. Henry, I'm not the fluttery type, but if that man is a criminal, he might have a gun. He and... has no gun. I'd have felt it when I lifted him up off the deck. Nevertheless, I still think it would be wiser to call the Coast Guard now. Mm. All right. I wish we'd never seen his boat. Darling, everything will work out. Someone calling us. K-O-E, Civic City Marine Operator, calling W-A-2758, El Dorado. Come in, please. Over. Hello, K-O-E. This is the El Dorado. W-A-2758, over. One moment, please. Dr. Wilson, this is Lieutenant Gilbert. Please listen to me. The ship you found named Neptune's Pal was stolen this afternoon. The man who stole it is named George Morgan. He is a dangerous criminal when armed. He is wanted by the FBI for murder. The FBI asked me to pass along the following message. They said that they cannot order you to place your life in jeopardy. But they request that you do not tell Morgan that you know who he is and that you continue to tow him in until you reach the harbor, at which point they will go aboard the stolen boat and arrest him. Over. All right, Lieutenant Gilbert. We'll tow the Neptune's pal in with us. Over. Thank you. That is all. Over and out. Henry, I don't like to interfere. Darling, there's no danger as long as he doesn't realize that we know who he is. But you do know. What? Down, Mrs. Wilson. Speak to the doctor. Look, you can't. Henry, he's got your gun. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint your friend, Lieutenant Gilbert, but I've got other plans. From now on, the three of us are staying together. Return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, listen. Before that clock has ticked away many more seconds, you may find yourself making an important decision. And that decision will be to get the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Well, I'm a father, Mr. Keating. What will that chart do for me? Well, Stan, I'll answer that question by asking another. If you should die unexpectedly, what monthly income would your wife and children need to live the way you want them to? Well, a 
I'm not sure. I suppose I could make a rough guess. You won't need to guess when you have the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. You'll know exactly how much money your family would need to maintain a decent standard of living. Look, here's a copy of the chart. Every foreseeable expense is provided for. See how easy it is to fill in, because you're guided by pictures every step of the way. You're right. My wife and I could do it in five minutes. Yes, that's all the time it takes with this equitable chart to figure out the minimum income your family would need to keep going and keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Okay, Mr. Keating, guess I'll buy one of these charts right away. Oh, you can't buy them, Stan. They're free. Phone your Equitable Society representative and ask him to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, share of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable representative. The more you love your family, the more gratified you will be that you listen carefully during the seconds that have just passed and that you decided to get the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Voyage of Terror. No one who sincerely has the interest of society at heart could possibly advocate the abolition of the parole system. And even if they did, the Federal Bureau of Investigation would take a stand wholeheartedly against any such proposal. However, the administration of the parole system in some of these 48 states is truly shocking. Of the 13,000 most desperate, vicious criminals listed in the identification files of your FBI, more than one quarter have been either paroled or pardoned. Among them in the past have been many who later graduated to the position of public enemy number one. Criminals like Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, Alvin Coppers, and John Dillinger. Your FBI appeals to you as representative citizens to look into the parole situation in your state. If handled correctly, the parole system can help to regenerate many a person who has been convicted because of extenuating circumstances. But when that system is abused, as it is currently being abused in some places, it can negate the best work of any law enforcement agency and put back on the street the criminal who has only recently been convicted of any crime in the book, up to and including murder. Night file continues as a Coast Guard cutter makes its way through the heavy fog. On deck are Special Agents Jim Taylor and Murray Broxton. Now, according to the chart, Murray, we're just about where the El Dorado was when Dr. Wilson called in this afternoon. Yes, I know, Jim. Between this cutter and the one that's searching the water south of here, I, I thought we would have found them by now. Well, they could be 50 feet from us, Jim, and we wouldn't know they were there. Lieutenant Gilbert said that this is the first time he could remember when fog lights didn't help at all. You know, I, I don't like not being able to get in touch with the Eldorado. I'm afraid they've run into trouble. I can only mean one thing. Morgan must have somehow gotten control. Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes, Lieutenant Gilbert. The radio room just got a message from the other cutter. They find the Eldorado? They found both the Eldorado and the Neptune's cab. Good. Wow. I'm afraid it's not so good so far as you men are concerned. Oh, why not? Two boats were drifting free. There wasn't a person aboard either one of them. Henry. Henry. Yes, Marjorie, I'm right here. How do you feel? My, my head. I shouldn't wonder. You hit your head on the deck when you painted. Oh. What happened, Henry? Where are we? We're in an apartment about a block from the ocean. An apartment? Morgan's apartment? No. No, it belongs to a friend of his. The two of them are in the next room now. Oh. Why is he holding us here? Well, I have an idea. He may try to use us as some sort of a shield. He can... Well, I'm glad to see that you're feeling better, Mrs. Wilson. When are you letting us out of here? Oh, real soon. A friend of mine is lending me his boat. We're all going to Mexico together. Mexico? No. I promise on my solemn word of honor. 
that if you release us, we won't go to the police. I'm sorry, I don't trust you. You'll never get out of the harbor in this fog. Mrs. Wilson, I won the Navy Cross during the war for my navigation. It was when the Marines were in trouble at Guadalcanal. Convoy loaded with fresh troops coming from the States got lost in the fog. I went out in the Look, we don't want to hear any more of your lies. Why, you... Take it easy, Doc. I, I don't... I don't quite have people call me a liar. Marjorie. Come on, Harry. Now, hear me good, both of you. I gave my friend a list of provisions for the boat. It'd probably take him a little time to get him aboard. We'll have to meet him in an hour. We'll leave by that window and back. We'll go down the fire escape of the alley. At the end of the alley is a pier and a flight of steps leading down to a float that runs underneath the pier. We'll wait on that float until my friend comes with a boat. And remember one thing. I've still got your gun. Special Agent Brockton speaking. Hello, Murray. This is Jim. I'm down Pacific City. What are you doing there? Well, after you went back to the office, Lieutenant Gilbert and I went to work trying to figure out how those two boats got to where they did. Uh-huh. We figured that Morgan must have gone ashore with Dr. and Mrs. Wilson and then allowed both the El Dorado and Neptune's pal to drift free. Now, our calculations showed that it almost had to be Pacific City. Well, where are you now? Police headquarters. Oh, there's a local alarm out on Morgan, also on Dr. and Mrs. Wilson. Any leads so far? No, nothing yet. Checked the bus station, railroad terminal, but no one answering Morgan's description has been seen at either place. How many hotels are there in Pacific City, Jim? Only six that are open this time of the year. Oh, they've all been checked, too. Well, I can't think uh, of... Pardon me, Marie. One more local policeman just came into the room. Want to see me? Oh, here you have. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Thanks very much. Uh, hello, Murray. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Jim. Morgan and Dr. Wilson were seen half an hour ago carrying Mrs. Who saw them? A mailman who was delivering a special delivery letter. According to this word I've just gotten, he made positive identification. Oh, that's fine. Fine, I'll send you down here. Well, there's no traffic on the road this time of night, Jim. It shouldn't take me more than about uh, 20 minutes. Good. Check at police headquarters when you get here. They'll know where I am. Are you in there, Jim? Murray? Ah, come on in. Well, uh, whose apartment is this? My name Charles Dixon. Well, how does he fit in? Well, when I found out that George Morgan had no apartment in this building, I checked through his arrest record to see if he'd ever been arrested with any of the tenants. Good hunch, Jim. Yeah, it was a good hunch. We were lucky. Dixon was arrested with Morgan at one time. How long have you been here? Only a couple of minutes. It took me a little while to get a search warrant for this place, then it took me about ten minutes to wake up the superintendent so that I could get a key. Mm-hmm. Found anything yet? Well, all I know for sure is that those other two people the mailman saw in the lobby with Morgan were Dr. and Mrs. Wilson. How do you know that? I found Mrs. Wilson's handbag in the next room. I see. So they've been here and moved on already. Now the question is, where did they go? No. Hey, Murray. Hmm? Come here, take a look at this. What is it, Jim? A writing tablet. Come on, I think I know where Morgan's headed. <laughs> Understand what's keeping my friend? He said for sure he'd meet us here under the pier. You cold, Marjorie? No, I'm all right, and I won't faint again. Hold it. The man at the end of the pier will search for us. Maybe he'll see us. You better not, for his sake and yours. I'll make it sound here. He comes. There's a boat a little way down the shore. It's coming this way. That must be my friend. How long do you intend to keep us in Mexico? Depends on how you behave. That boat just pulled into another pier. I saw that. Maybe your friend took that money you gave him for provisions and ran away. No. There's his boat now. <laughs> Steady, dear. That's 
you, Charlie? No, Morgan. Not. Huh? Put your hands up in the air. Special agents, the FBI. Oh, yes. Dr. Wilson? Yes. Good. Agent Brockton will see to it that you and Mrs. Wilson are taken back up to where the El Dorado is anchored. All right, Morgan. Come on, we're going to headquarters. <laughs> George Morgan was tried in a federal court, convicted, and given the death penalty. Charles Dixon, who harbored and aided him, was sentenced to a term in a federal penitentiary. In searching the apartment of Charles Dixon for a clue as to where George Morgan had fled, Special Agent Taylor found a cheap writing tablet. Because of his training, he was able to read the indentations on the top sheet of paper. He recognized the various items as a list of provisions, and when he saw the item fresh water, he realized that Morgan intended to make another trip by boat. An immediate check at the only provision store open all night brought about the arrest of Charles Dixon on a charge of harboring a fugitive. When confronted with the fact that Morgan might kill Dr. and Mrs. Wilson and that that would make him a full accessory to their murder, Dixon revealed his rendezvous point with Morgan to the two special agents. They thereupon used his boat so that Morgan would not be suspicious at the approach of a strange craft with the results which you have already witnessed. And thus, your FBI not only ended the career of this vicious killer, but it also very probably saved the lives of two innocent people. By so doing, the two special agents lived up to their oath as protectors of the lives and property of you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. Yes, our clock goes ticking on. Time goes rushing by. So don't postpone that important decision you made a few minutes ago. Get that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers right away. Then you can make sure that even if the unexpected does happen, the house your children live in will still be a comfortable home. A secure home. A happy home. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this ABC station. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The graphic story of the flight of two hunted criminals. Its subject... Jewel Pep. It's titled The Prodigal Brother. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Prodigal Brother on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.